What's happening, everybody? We're back for the severe setup. Ian O'Neill, Harry Powell are here to talk about a couple of different t- subjects today. We're going to go in a couple of different directions, news topics, upcoming UFC card this weekend. Not a great one. We're not focusing too much time on that. A couple of fights that were announced last week as well. What's the big secret? Why aren't I telling everyone exactly what we're talking about? Because we're just going to do it in a couple of minutes anyway. Paul used to the UFC, or to the PFL, excuse me, Paul Hughes to the PFL. God damn it. God damn it. That was nearly as big as a mess up. That's a Freudian slip, that is. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. But well, we will talk about the UFC after we talk about Paul Hughes. The Vegas card this weekend. McGregor Chandler is announced. Islam versus Dustin announced. Sean Strickland versus Costa announced. Talk about all of those. And no better man to do it other than Harry Powell. How are you, sir? How are you keeping? Are you well? I am well, indeed. Obviously, we had a... We had a week off there. I missed seeing your face. Um, Ian and I usually meet at, 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 at a dark hour here in London town, and we usually crack right on with these types of things. But we spent the, the past half an hour just catching up and doing the things, and now we'll actually talk about some fights. So I am very happy to be here as always, and uh, and, and I thank you, sir. Let's get going. Let's get going. Paul Hughes to the UFC. It's the big news. It was the biggest news that happened. Or did I wait? I've said that again. What is going on? Because I'm saying what I actually wanted in my head, I think, is it Paul to the PFL, biggest news this weekend. When the news uh, uh, came across your social media, what was your initial thoughts, Harry? I looked at it immediately, and I, I can't lie, I looked immediately as a fan. And immediately as a fan, I was saddened that the UFC did not pull out the stops that they clearly needed to have in order to secure a talent like Paul Hughes. Secondarily, I immediately put my media hat on and I said, well, okay, look, he could go to PFL. He could win a million dollar tournament. And then he could ride out and say, look, I've got a clause in my contract. Maybe he's negotiated this. There's a clause in his contract to say that if the UFC come in at some point and this and that, and the next thing he can, he can go and he can, he can compete for the UFC. I then said, if he signed for the PFL, that means they've paid more than the UFC have paid. If he signed for the PFL, it's likely that means that that's more than what say a KSW have offered or, you know, enter fight promotion. And so I am very pleased that Paul Hughes has gotten paid. I think one of the, the the criticisms, probably one of the only criticisms of Cage Warriors, and they are very open about this, is that their pay structure does not allow fighters to go and earn hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds. And so the PFL coming in and clearly offering Hughes uh, uh, a good enough salary to turn him away from the UFC, that that pleases me greatly because he is somebody that has fought in the trenches of cage warriors for a long, long, long time. And it is about time that financially he was rewarded for that. But I would be remiss to say that I was salivating at the idea of him competing either at 145 or 155 in the UFC's divisions. And there were so many matchups that I was so, so, so excited to see him in. And now will we get that? Maybe. Will it be too late in his career? Maybe. Do we get to see him now at least step up in competition and have an opportunity to sort of show us the level against other people? Yes, yes, we do. And so I can't be too saddened by that. Yeah, 100%. I'm kind of along the same lines as yourself, Harry, You know, w- with the news. Um, first of all, I'm very happy he's getting paid. And I think the way I would overlay all of my thoughts on Paul Hughes' signing to the PFL is that there's a big, big difference in what I want as a person for somebody and what they want and what they need for themselves. And I think what I wanted was to see Paul test himself against some of the UFC level talent. I think he was good enough to make a a damn good dent in that lightweight division. Um, Maybe even flirt with Federate, even though he's not too keen to go back down there. I think, you know, lightweight is his destination. Uh, But at the same time, you can't. You can't argue with the fact that, you know, PFL is coming in here with a damn good offer. UFC did come in. The offer was, what he said, uh, uh, not meaningful enough. Um, What we are told based off the deal, that he has signed for both 2025 and 2026 one million tournaments. He will fight in 2024 three times. 
Um, and uh, the PFL made an offer that he couldn't refuse, a good offer um, and a better one than the UFC offered him as well. So a couple of tidbits to take from that. Uh, he wants to fight three more times in 2024. That's exciting if it happens. Uh, you know, I I would have a little bit of weary of what the PFL has promised the consumer, um, you know, in, re- in the last number of years and, and them really not, the, the kind of thing is not materializing the way they've said it. Like we're still waiting for Francis. Uh, we're still waiting for Jake Paul, to be fair, as well. Um, but one thing we can say about Paul Hughes is that he actually does want to fight mixed martial arts <laughs> and he is looking uh, to to make those big bucks and, and move up the rankings. A couple of exciting possible matchups for him in the tournaments next year. I think, you know, a couple of additions plus, you know, what we'd seen before, he's a damn good chance of winning those tournaments in 2025 and 2026. Um, I hope that they can keep him busy in an exciting manner up until those tournaments happen. Um, you know, the first one is uh, this year's tournament has just kicked off uh, a couple of weeks back. We're not going to see Paul fight in these tournaments until around this time next year. So it's a long time to be not left on the shelf, but you know, I'm hoping that we're going to see maybe a couple of names from Bellator. Maybe I, I think the Bellator card would be quite interesting to have him on in, in June as well. And um, all in all, yeah, it's, it's exciting to see him move on to the next chapter. Uh, yes. Slight, dis- a little bit of slight disappointment that it's not the UFC. That's not Paul's fault. That's, you know, this pay structure within the UFC doesn't really accommodate somebody like Paul right now, unfortunately, you know, Paul would have been expected to probably go in on lesser pay um, and fight these tough matchups. Um, you know, maybe fight out his contract, get another contract where he might still not have been making an, as much as he would for the PFL. And and I think, look, the decision is made. Now we can lay out the blueprint. And, uh, you know, that being said, I wouldn't say, Harry, that this signing with the PFL would ever completely rule out somebody like Paul joining for the UFC Um, You know, we talk about structure, pathways, um, you know, what you should follow in mixed martial arts for the development of your career and obviously for the developmental (laughs) development of your bank account as well is very, very important. Probably the most important thing when you're talking about combat sports. And, you know, there's nothing maybe wrong with Paul coming in here, competing in the tournaments, doing well in the tournaments, earning his money and then, you know, fighting out a contract. And then, you know, maybe going to the UFC in a couple of years' time as well. Um, do you see an outcome like that? Or, you know, what do you think? It's hard to say, really, but I don't think we should ever rule it out. And there is a couple of good matchups in for him at the PFL as well. Anyone that might stick to mind uh, for him to come in and take on or anyone at all? What do you think? Aaron Pico. Thanks. Yes, that's uh, yeah, I, we Me and Shawnee mentioned that as well. Oh, me, give me Aaron Pico. You got AJ McKee is a good one as well. Like, I mean, it's all of them, the, the Pitbull brothers, if they fancy it. Like, yeah, and Kins 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 all dependent on those guys moving up to, though. We got to remember. So, I think, look, uh, there's a couple of points here. The first one is if Michael Chandler can do it, Paul Hughes can do it, right? And I know that it's a slightly different time now in that the restructure has allowed for this cross pollination of fighters between PFL and Bellator. And I think that that does offer some very interesting matchups for both Paul Hughes and the Bellator roster and the PFL roster, obviously. I think if you're PFL, what would be very smart here is you give Paul Hughes a couple of, not gimmies, right, but some fights that allow him to showcase his skills against names that people know mm-hmm. in the three fights running up to the tournament. I, yeah, I, like there's a... I think these last couple of fights have been showcase fights. I think that's these under, next ones have to be more meaningful than that's under the Cage Warriors banner, though, right? Like, yeah, yeah. PFL and Bellator have to sell them to their audience. Cage Warriors have a very specific, very niche audience, and whilst there will certainly be some crossover, there is then some crossover between the PFL and Bellator. Now, when I say fights to to build Paul Hughes, Aaron Pico and AJ McKee can absolutely be fights in the PFL 
and or Piat Palace or whatever, that allow Paul to showcase his skills, right? They could be one of those those three fights. I think, especially the other side of it, is if he wants to be active, it may be hard to draw up those fights, those big name fights, prior to him going into the tournament in 2024, right? We are four months in, right? Some of those fighters, they're not fighting three times a year anyway, right? They might be fighting twice a year or whatever it is. So to line them up for Paul Hughes may potentially be difficult. I think what the PFL want to do here is they have made an investment in a fighter in Paul Hughes and they need to get a return on that investment. And the best way to get a return on that investment is to make him a star. The way you make him a star is you build him like a star, right? And so that doesn't mean, unfortunately for us, that you go in and, you know, he's fighting AJ McKee right out of the door or he's fighting Patricio out of the door if he wants to move up or whatever it is, right? I just don't, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I also think, just to put your second point in, I absolutely think that he could win the the 2025, 2026, or at least have a fantastic run in the 2025, 2026 tournament. And if he then wants to turn around, bow out and go to the UFC, we've seen it with Michael Chandler. I don't think it's outside of the realms of possibility whatsoever. I just question, Paul Hughes has had a long history in MMA already. He spoke in the promo that there were four handbrakes in a year. That does something to a fighter, right? That does something to somebody's uh, uh, skeletal frame, right? Having mm -hmm. that amount of trauma, that amount of damage. Now, he's managed to stay relatively injury-free. Obviously, we had a, a couple of pullouts in cage warriors because of some injuries. And so I, my only fear for Paul Hughes is that does his body withstand the tournament format, which we know is rough already? Does it hold up then across the expanse of time as he starts to fight these higher level guys to then get him to the UFC? Because, you know, let's be honest, there is always going to be elite level talent in the UFC. Maybe not as elite as it used to be, but there will always be elite level talent in the UFC. And I just, I just hope that one day we get to see Paul Hughes in all of his glory donning those strangely shaped new gloves that the UFC has. <laughs> yeah, it'd be interesting to see. But going back to matchups, I think the time for showcasing is over. I think he's been showcasing for a long time. And I understand what you're saying. You're going to call pretty much any fight outside of tournament format in PFL a showcase fight. That's what they do any which way. I think you put him in there with somebody like I would go like Saladin Parnas first. If they sign Saladin Parnas, put him in there first. Let's see. Two of the two of the hottest lightweights in Europe right now. Who's the best? Let's find out. Boom. Put him in there. Let's find out. If you're good, you think you're the best in the world, you know what I mean? That's it. I don't I don't like that's why he's telling us right now. Paul Hughes is telling us he's the best in the world. Let's get him out there and get him facing competition that's going to prove that. He he said it himself, he wants to prove that. I think Saladin Parnas is the first. I say, you know, I understand with some people maybe saying that, you know, maybe not for the first fight, they need to build them. What do we need to build them for? Like, we don't need, we know who, like a lot of people do know who Paul Hughes is with this big story and everything like that. If you didn't want to do Parnas first, do someone like Jeremy Stevens first. Get the, uh, maybe get uh, a legend in there, you know. And uh, what you definitely don't want for Paul Hughes is to, to increase his chances of losing before that tournament starts. That's that's a big one. But at the same time, you have to find that fine balance in not matching him up too easy as well because we, we've seen him go out there and, and truck a couple of boys over his last couple of fights. And, you know, it's great seeing him perform, but, you know, you want to see him tested in some regards as well. So it's very, very exciting now what they'll do with him. I think the Bellator Dublin card is a, is a, good, uh, is a good fit for him. I think... You know, you put your, you put your maybe slight disappointment to the side, and I think this move is probably a good move for him financially, Fantastic. for sure. Fantastic. I just hope that the PFL can nurture his talent, number one, and also build him up into the star that he deserves to be. So, um, that's going to be very interesting to see because there have been some critics. I mean, we've been out here talking about, you know. Bellator's frustrating matchmaking style, mm -hmm. fighters being kept on the shelf, 
you know what I mean? All of those complaints don't slowly go out the window, uh, you know, for, for, you know, the lack of wanting Paul Hughes to be successful or, or blowing up this kind of signing. It's up, you know, Paul Hughes has left all of his cards in the PFL's hands and it's up to the PFL to deal him a good set of cards out of what this, or like after what they have decided um, to get together and, and build. But like you're looking at Paul Hughes being built by the PFL, you're looking at PFL being built by Paul Hughes. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it's up to both of these guys. And I think Paul Hughes is going to live up to his end of the bargain. I can guarantee that, to be honest. And I hope that the PFL can kind of do him right as well in terms of putting him in good, exciting matchups. And uh, it's great to see that he will be in that tournament next year. And, you know, I wonder, we'll see how many Irish fans are willing to stay up on a Thursday night uh, at four or five in the morning to watch him fight. That's <laughs> that's another small little thing I, I think could be a little bit of an issue as well. I do think that the the tournament format suits Paul's style, though. Mm. But it is a worry. Like, I mean, what you said is 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 totally legit. It's a it's a real, real, real tough tournament on the body. Brendan Lochnane has said it. Anybody that has said it, uh, I, I'm I'm not sure. Only minimal people have won it two times in a row as well, because you're constantly in camp. It is a season format. You're fighting you know, uh, four times in the space of my, around eight months, I'd say. So that's tough. It's a tough ask on the body. And, you know, you go out there, you perform well, you get injured, you're out of that tournament and you're out of the chance to win $1 million or so as well. So, I mean, you're banking a lot on, on things going right here when you're talking about this tournament format. But, uh, I you agree. Know. I do think, though, like I said, with the, with the, with the, 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 Paul Hughes doesn't really do wars. It doesn't no. really do them, you know, and and he's got such a such a clever ability to dictate fights and to to take fights where he where he's the safest. Now, don't get me wrong; he's been in. He's he's taken some shots. He's taken some knocks. Obviously, well, he he's kind of proved that he can do it if he wants. But I think he has the skill set not to be forced into that, and which comes with experience as well. I think you know, you look at that first Fuchenich fight. It was a pre, it was a war. It was a a, a war of attrition. But, you know, you've seen what he picked up from that and that, what he brought into the Morgan Sharia fight and what he brought into that Fuchenich rematch as well was uh, an ultimate technician, a guy that, you know, chose not to um, get into that war there as well. So, I mean, yeah, there's going to be lots of interesting fights. Uh, I mean, there's a serious talent coming through in the PFL as well. Just, uh, I just hope that, yeah, I hope it all works out in terms of him being done right uh, and his skills being nurtured and uh you know I, i'm feeling i'm feeling pretty good about that to be honest but uh, i i just hope i think i think there's other exterior stuff that's going on with pfl right now that uh they need to improve on but we've seen slight some slight improvements with the production with the coverage everything like that so yeah uh, hopefully all goes any final thoughts before we move on harry to the next uh the next topic i just want to reiterate one more time that I'm just so happy that Paul Hughes was smart enough to to lead with his wallet. There yeah, is not, a- listen, not listen to silly whores like me that just want him to go in and take little <laughs> money. <laughs> but like, but I, I don't get me wrong. The the ceiling of money is obviously far higher in the UFC. It obviously is, right? If you're a main event on a pay-per-view card and you've negotiated pay-per-view points, that's millions and millions of dollars potentially for you, right? But Paul Hughes is going to have to put in such an incredible shift to get there. And in a division like Lightweight, there's no guarantees that you ever make it there. You could be one of the best fighters in the world. Look at Armin Saryukin and look how long it's taken him to get to a position where he's knocking on the door of a title shot and he doesn't even get it just poor. He only has to come in too and fight Islam Hatchev in his first fight as well in the UFC. You know, you know what I mean? Like, like it's, there's, yeah. there's just no guarantee. Uh, I, I completely understand it. Like, I, I mean, I can, I can say in certain terms that I am a little bit disappointed that it's not the UFC, but I completely understand. And I'm actually glad that he has chosen that route as well for himself, you know? Right. And I think, uh, you know, Paul Hughes or the PFL, is not the problem here. The problem is the UFC and their lack of want to invest in somebody of Paul Hughes's skill set 
And, um, you know, that's a business model that's working for them. You I mean, it could be that's a completely different conversation. I have been the same about Cedric Dumbe. I've said the same. I've said the same about Roberto Saldic. So I'm not going to change my tune for Paul Hughes, but I am glad that he is getting paid. And I do understand why the Saldic's and the Dumbe's and all that makes that makes that makes those decisions, too. It's more so um, a disappointment in the system and the way things are done more so than the actual scenario that we're talking about right now. So. I think that's a, a, a one fifty five. Yeah, he's one. He, yeah, I think he could. Yeah, I think, I think so, he so could. One fifty five. Let's see Paul Hughes versus Cedric Dumbe in Paris. Let's see it. Oh, boom! Bish bash bosh. I love it. Yeah, Paul Hughes destroys him. Though he, no, he's no ground game, does he? Who gives a fuck? Who, Who cares? cares? Who cares? Just like, get him in there. Cedric Dumbe, massive name. Paul Hughes goes in in Paris, beats him. Stop. That's the storyline of itself. What are we talking about? Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. The last, the last person to beat Cedric Dumbe, Baki, he's gone on to the UFC now. Yeah. So crazy. Yeah. Speaking, speaking of the UFC, a card this weekend. UFC Apex is back in all its glory, um, and not a great card overall. Mateus Nicolau versus Alex Perez, your main event. Ryan Spann versus Bogdan Guskov. How does Ryan Spann... Let, let's start here, Harry. How the fuck does Ryan Spann land in a co-main event to slot after his last fight against Anthony Smith and how it went down? It's shocking. I don't know what to tell you. I honestly don't know what to tell you. What's your favorite fight on this card? Okay, so I think I have two, right? Um, I really like the main event. I really like the main event just because we get to see Nick, Mateus Nicolau. It feels like it's been ages since we've seen him. I think a lot has changed at flyweight since he's last fought. And so this is a really good opportunity for him to come in and throw his own name into the mix at 125 for that title shot. Alex Perez, perennial contender, probably never going to see a title shot again. I do favor Nicolau in, in this fight quite heavily. Um, always, always happy to see David Onama fighting. And I think Jonathan Pierce is a is a really, really solid test for him. Uh, interested to see how Michael Figlak looks against Austin Hubbard. Uh, if Hani Aya is fighting, I will always, always watch it. But I think my favorite, I've realized what I've just done is actually given you three fights instead of the one fight, which is the question that you asked me. But I think my favorite fight on the card is going to be Jonathan Pierce versus David Onama. Mm, interesting choice. Um... Why would you say that? Jonathan Pierce fucking goes for it, and David Onama fucking goes for it, and both of them have power. Both of them, I think, could be something in 145 pounds. I think the ceiling is is a little higher for David Onama, and we get to see with David Onama, does he have that potential to maybe start looking toward a ranking and start looking at some slightly better names? And Jonathan Pierce is just a bit of a truck, but um. Yeah, I think I think it's it's also one of usually my favorite fights are the most competitive fights, and I'm not sure Nicolau and Perez is going to be super super competitive, but I feel like Pierce and Onama could be. Yeah, no, that's fair. I um, I'm terribly disappointed that uh, Manuel Cape didn't make hundred fight again. Uh, like this is like I mean we've been teased with that fight probably around five times. It's like the flyweight divisions Tony Ferguson Habib at this stage. It is and fair play to Alex Perez for coming in and 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 taking this fight as well. Uh, it'll be an interesting one. I fancy Mateus Nicolau. Looking forward to seeing him back in action as well. Um, looking at uh, the rest of the card, I like Victor Henry as a fighter. I think him versus Randy Aya is going to be an interesting fight. Uh, glad to see Mikel Figlak back. Um, you know, he's coming in there against Austin Hubbard, and that's a tough fight for him against Austin Hubbard. Um, lost to Fury Saeem, um, who has, you know, gone on to look really good. You know, it, it kind of, Saeem kind of clicked against Figlak, shall we say, as a fighter, and, and has really gone on there as well. So looking forward, like, I mean, for Figlak, not an easy roll of the dice here against Austin Hubbard, really, isn't it? No, no it's not. I mean, that was one of the, 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 the fights that I mentioned just because, it's really interesting to see where Figlak actually is. You come into the UFC, you take your first loss, no problem. Now what? Who are you? Like, who are you? Are you? Do you? Do you deserve to be in the organization? Because if you do, he'll come out and he may not win against Hubbard, but he'll show us that he belongs, right? And if yeah. he doesn't, then he's going to get a very, very tough third matchup as well. And it will likely be his marching papers. And he's probably back to the, to, 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 to cage warriors or, or something similar. But I, um, I, I think 
Hubbard is happy to have a bit of a war, and I feel like Figlak can accept him in a war should he need to. Um, I don't know necessarily who wins the war, but but I think both of them are happy to have them. Um, but yeah, I you got to feel for Figlak at the end of the day. You've got to feel for Figlak. There is such a, especially in that division, there is such a step up between the Cage Warriors regional scene and then the UFC. Yeah, for a 27 year old as well. Like, I mean, to me, he's kind of getting a little bit like the, uh, not as extreme as Reese McKee, but, you know, tough, tough matchups to enter into the into the UFC. Like at 155, there's a couple of other different ones out there for Figlak, but Austin Hubbard, man, is a guy who's been in there time and time again, like massive little amounts of experience there against a guy like Figlak. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with that one? One I'd like to kind of stop and talk about as well. Kareen Silva has been on a real good run, uh, as has Ariane Lipsky. Um, you know, she's really found a resurgence in her career, having won her last three fights. Harry got to see the last one, obviously, against Casey O'Neill, myself live uh, at the T Mobile at UFC 296. And, you know, Kareen Silva coming through Dana White's contender series has been on a bit of a run, but this is a big, big test for her against like a UFC veteran and a UFC veteran that's on a good winning streak right now. Um, I have a feeling this is going to be a pretty exciting stand-up battle if it, if it plays out that way, because we know Lipsky likes to stand and bag. Green Silva's got some flashy striking as well. Uh, and this one has has the makings of a, a pretty exciting fight, I think. I'd say so. Um, I actually think this is a huge test for both ladies. Like, Lipsky likes to perform when she is dictating the pace. And I know that sounds really silly to say, because if you asked any fighter, would you like to dictate the pace of the fight? The answer is obviously going to be yes. But she really, really revels in an ability to set the pace of a fight. And Kareen Silva is a absolute fucking whirlwind. And I do question here, is Lipsky going to be technical enough and have enough power to force Kareem Silva to respect her in those initial exchanges? Because if she doesn't, we've seen Ariane Lipsky wilt. We've seen Ariane Lipsky in positions where she's struggling and can't find her way back. Now, this is only three rounds, right? So it's not as though we've got five rounds here and, and whatever, whatever. But I do feel like Kareen Silva has a fantastic chance if she comes out with the right type of game plan. Five finishes in the last five fights. That's very, very, very impressive, especially under the UFC banner, especially in a division that doesn't see a ton of finishes. And so, uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm high on both women, but I just, I'm not sure that I fully trust Lipsky's resurgence just yet. The Casey O'Neill fight, there's obviously some context around that. Casey O'Neill was out for a long time, coming back off a big injury, etc., etc. Kareem Silva, we know, has been on a... Well, that was Casey O'Neill's second fight back off the injury now, has to be said. But I do agree with you that I don't feel Casey O'Neill has shown the levels that she was shown before that injury. And obviously, a bad injury like that is very, very tough to come back from. But um, no, Casey O'Neill had fought um someone before that oh, let me get the name up here real quick um uh apologies for that but yeah i mean casey o'neill had fought jennifer maya ahead of that that was her oh, first fight right. back and lost that decision that's right obviously lost to lipsky and you know i i'm looking at lipsky and you know what you're justified in saying that you can't fully trust it yeah i definitely trusted a hell of a lot more than i did in her last you know, three fights ago, four fights ago. I think you come in and you grind out a decision against someone like JJ Aldridge. You know, Lipsky came in against JJ Aldridge, basically fighting for her UFC career. You know, and that's not an easy woman. We've talked about JJ Aldridge time and time again on this one. Team yeah, she, JJ Aldridge. <laughs> absolutely, yeah, hundred percent. And you know, and look at this one. Now you're fighting the young hungry talent that's on a on a bit of a tear too so i i like that one i think we're after speaking now i'm actually more excited for that one after talking to you about it than than i was um before we started you have um you have our guy um david onama uh obviously um he was a guy that we were talking about uh, as a quite a promising 145 pounder uh losses to mason jones losses to nate land um you know kind of Poured a little bit of cold water on that hype, I guess. Uh, a good win uh, against Gabriel Santos. Well, he's coming in against Jonathan Pierce. It's a fight that you mentioned at the very start. You're you're looking forward to this one. And I tell you, this is a tough one that he has in Jonathan Pierce again. 
if he doesn't have that great, if he doesn't have that will to win, you know, Jonathan Pierce is a guy that can kind of smother you in the later stages of a fight. So it'll be interesting to see what Anama has in his pocket for this. Definitely. And these are the tests that you're going to get at 145. Do you know what I mean? Like there's just, there's absolutely nowhere to hide. Absolutely nowhere to hide in any of these divisions. And David Anama is a good prospect, obviously a really good athlete. He's got good power in his hands. But sometimes it's just not enough, you know what I mean? And he's young, and so there's plenty of time for him to jump gaps and make big, big, big macro changes in his game. I just don't know whether he has. And so Jonathan Pierce is a really good test for me because, again, we'll stand and bang if you want him to, could do a bit of the grappling if you want him to, but we'll be in your face for 15 minutes. And that's really, that's exactly what David Onama needs. Can he fight on the back foot? Can he push someone back like Jonathan Pierce? Can he circumnavigate the pressure of Jonathan Pierce if it gets to it? What we're going to find out, we're going to find out. It's a great fight. I really like it. Yeah, really do. I know you're buzzing too for Don Tell Mays versus Chow Machado. Oh, I'll leave the I'll leave the stream right now. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> All right, let's move on. Let's move on to uh, a big, big fight that was um look at we got like 12 minutes out. Of that. I thought that we wouldn't get as much, so fair play to us. Um let's talk on to a couple of big fights that were announced last week. Um McGregor versus Chandler is official UFC 303 June 29th International Fight Week at Welterweight. Um, the will he, won't he conundrum is done. He's back. It's official. Did you ever think, you know, I, I honestly never thought there was a, um, I never thought that McGregor was never going to come back and fight again. I always knew he was going to come back. Um, a lot of people did doubt it. A lot of people are still doubting it, even though that this fight has been made official. Did you ever think that? And do you still think that way? Or what do you think of the fight? Uh, a, a trio of questions in one there. Do I doubt it now the fight's been signed? No, McGregor doesn't pull out of fights. It just doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. We have seen it over his career. He does not pull out of fights. His opponent may pull, and so fights may fizzle or whatever it is, but Conor McGregor doesn't pull out of fights. It just doesn't. So do I think it will happen? Yes, I think Conor McGregor will make it. I think Michael Chandler will make it. Um, did I ever think he was going to fight again? I was confident he would fight again. I wasn't sure whether it was going to be MMA, go back to boxing, do something else. I wasn't a hundred percent sure. Um, but the elixir of the fight game is something that is entrenched and combined with the blood in Conor McGregor's veins. It just, it just is, it is part of who he is. I understand that there are lucrative whiskey deals and pubs and bars and films and, you know, fashion brands and whatever it is that comes Conor McGregor's way. And those things I am sure are incredibly enticing and incredibly lucrative. And they do take some of your time and attention away from the fighting, but it feels to me as though there is still very, very strong burning inside of Conor McGregor, a deep, deep necessity to fight. And do I think that he will ever stop fighting? Yeah, of course, there'll come a day where I think he will realize that this isn't for him anymore. This isn't who he is anymore, maybe, or, you know, any of these great nature of things. But I don't think it's any time in the next sort of two to three years. I feel like, I feel like, and this is my bold prediction, Shawnee, is Connor is going to be one of the sad stories, I think, where he will keep fighting past the time that he probably should keep fighting, whether that's in boxing or in other realms, because he is, he is so, <clears throat> excuse me, he is so used to being, successful he is so used to being the hardest worker in the room he is so used to being a guy that can make anything happen and in fighting that's a that's a dangerous prospect i've slightly tan tangented off here but uh the answer to my question was was no i always thought he was going to fight yeah no no that tangent is is justified and definitely meaningful as well and it's it's a thing that's been on my mind as well but we haven't been in a, a mixed martial arts world with conor mcgregor winning in quite some time and i think you know people don't realize when conor mcgregor is winning in mixed martial arts how good it is for mixed martial arts as a whole and i think you know that's something that we should be trying to latch on to ahead of this fight as well now you know latching on to something like that is not always going to be what the reality of the situation is and what the reality of the situation is heading into this fight harry is that conor is coming back from 
a devastating injury. Uh, we don't know how his body is going to hold up. Um, we don't know how it's going to hold up in the fight itself. Um, but in terms of matchups with Chandler, this is this kind of standard blueprint opponent that McGregor has been fighting and has been beaten throughout his career. Um, but it's a huge, huge ask for him to, number one, to get back. You know, I think it should be celebrated a little bit more the fact that Conor McGregor has worked his way into a position where he's even able to come back after such a devastating injury, um, number one. And if he's mildly competitive, I think it's a success story. Um, I'm not too, I'm not too kind of, I haven't seen enough yet to make me too confident that he is going to be able to go out there and get the win. Um, when you see do these matching up now that it is official, have you started that thought process on how the fight might look and, and who you think might win? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I don't I, I don't I don't have a great confidence in Conor McGregor right now. I don't have a great confidence in Conor McGregor for a couple of reasons. One, do we even know that he knows that his body is gonna hold up? You know, when you when you Okay. We have had so much access to Conor McGregor over the years. We have got to see elements of the depths of his psyche, the way that he thinks about things, the way that he ruminates on things. We saw when he broke a toe or he broke his foot or whatever it was, there was immediate anger. And then in, in, in a matter of, you saw it in his face that his doctor sort of positioned the foot and he was immediately was like, oh, I'm grand, I'm fine, I can carry on. We're good here, we're ready to go. Like that's not just all fighters because you know there's an element that it is all fighters but there is a difference when it comes to to conor mcgregor there is a difference of belief that conor mcgregor had that was one of the things that set him apart so greatly from other fighters when he was coming up and what what changes what changes when okay you roll your ankle you get a leg kick the achilles goes you lose a fight fine the next one you literally snap your leg into you take all the time you need to come back from that. Sure, you can kick pads hard. Sure, you can spar hard. Sure, you can this and that. But the next time you step into that octagon, that's the same place that your leg broke in half a year and a bit ago. How do you know? How can you trust? Can you trust that your body will hold up in the same way? The same thing that you had, and Connor's talked about this again ad nauseum, is the relationship that he had with his body the feeling of invincibility that he had in his body. And now that absolutely is shattered. And you're coming in against a guy in Michael Chandler who doesn't really take time out of the gym. And we know that Conor McGregor has flirted with training, come in and out of training. He's obviously had commitments with films and businesses and this and that and the other. And so uh, what what Conor do we get? I just, I just don't know what kind of we get in 2024. I just don't. What does know. he, what does he have to do, in your opinion, to to convince us, Harry? I think if he turns up, and I, the thing I'm most interested in, right, and forget the fighting for a second, is which Conor McGregor turns up on fight week, because we have seen the literally hungry Conor McGregor at 100, 145 pounds, and he's just a ravaged animal. You know, we've seen him at 155 and he's the braggadocious. He's got a little bit of stake in him, right? We've seen the videos, got a bit of stake in him and he's happy to go and he's ready to go and he's confident. He's full to the brim. We've seen 170 Conor McGregor who was humble and overshot that initial beef up. The second Conor McGregor who was just a, a wrecking ball at 170. Then we have seen Conor flip over to the boxing and do whatever. We've seen Conor come back. We've seen him at 155 where really he probably is his best weight class. And then all those times in those fight weeks, we've seen him move from, I'm a father now, less trash talk, really respect Dustin Poirier, really respect this, really respect that. Then a little line of shit talk here, then ever a sprinkling of it on top, a bit of the old Conor McGregor. Like, who is he when he spends every day for eight weeks in the gym? and then home with his family? Who is he when he's back in the MMA world? Does Which Conor McGregor are we going to see? Because I think that will tell me a lot to begin with. But what does he need to do to prove it? I think if he goes in and he is, like you've already said, is competitive with Michael Chandler, that's all the proof I need. Yeah, indeed. And I'm uh, very excited to see what happens. So that, one last question on this before we move on. What does an MMA world look like if we wake up the Sunday morning after UFC 303 with a Conor McGregor 
win. And the numerous amount of opportunities, the numerous amount of stories, and the numerous amount of narratives that a win over Michael Chandler would create. I think we're going to disagree here. I don't know that it changes too dramatically. Mm -hmm. Let me explain. I think the UFC obviously know what they're doing, right? TV deals coming up. Connor has to fight. Connor fights. Big pay-per-view. Amazing numbers. Wonderful. Here's our TV deal. Look at all of our amazing numbers. We've got this, the, the biggest star in MMA, blah, 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 blah. I also feel like the UFC's transitioned itself to sit in a position where they've never needed Conor McGregor less from an overarching perspective, right? Alex Poetan Bahia has sort of captured the hearts and minds of many of the MMA community. Nowhere near to the heights that Conor McGregor has, but we have a collection, if you will. We have a, a Sean O'Malley obviously doing things, Israel Adesanya doing things, Alex Poetan Bahia doing things. We now have uh, Islam Makachev has a massive share of that audience. Max Holloway has a share of that audience. Ilya Taporia is an absolute megastar in Spain. And so they have this smattering across the board of these athletes that when the, the power vacuum of Conor McGregor sort of disappeared from MMA for a little bit, naturally these seedlings have started to sprout. Now, if Conor McGregor wins, you best believe they're trying to make a title shot with Leon Edwards. You best believe that whatever Connor wants, whatever the UFC wants, there's a massive blockbuster stage for somebody like Connor to come back in a huge, huge, huge way. But I do wonder, I do wonder, and I would be, I can't wait to see, but I do wonder if the Connor McGregor effect is still as strong in 2024 as it was five years ago, as it was six years ago. We won't know that until he goes out there and, and fights and wins. I think we, we're living in a world where Conor McGregor hasn't won competitively in, what, once in the last five years, once in 2016? Long time ago. Like, it's a long time. And, you know, people kind of forget what that kind of world was like because it was fun and it opened up a lot of avenues. But I think it would be very interesting to see what happens if he does go out there and gets the job done. Now, there's lots of barriers in the way. There's lots of hurdles to jump over before we get to that point. But uh, in a world where the UFC is absolutely thriving right now, um, it'll be very, very interesting to see what happens if Conor throws his, his hat into the ring again, as one might suggest. Got to remember this contract situation lingering over as well is going to prove very, very interesting. Uh, we could talk about this for another hour or two, uh, but uh, I'm sure we'll talk about it a lot, lot more in between now and June 29th. 302, Newark, New Jersey. Islam Mahatcha versus Dustin Poirier, your main event for the lightweight title. Harry is shaking his head here if you're not watching on video. I know he's not happy at this. I'll lead into this fight with a question about a completely different fighter, Harry. Armin Saryukin was offered this fight straight after UFC 300. I think I might know the answer to this question if I know you as a person. Do you think it was a good idea or a bad idea for him to turn down that fight? Couldn't have been a better decision for him to turn down that fight on fight night. Couldn't have been a better decision. Yeah, I, I would agree myself. And we did speak about it as well on the balance breakdown, I believe, um, as well. But very, very unfair for the UFC to come and put him in that predicament right after just getting out of one fight. But, uh, you know, the UFC who don't make fights on the night of events went ahead and tried to make one fight and couldn't make that so they made another one and then they made two more again after that as well so you know take of that what you will but what we do have on deck is Islam Mahachev back in business again fighting Dustin Poirier fighting a legit lightweight Harry a lot of people wanted it although they weren't happy what to see him with Charles they don't want to call Charles a legit lightweight but that's what the fans online have been saying he hasn't defended his title against a legit lightweight I tell you Alexander Volkanovsky looks pretty, looked pretty legit in that first lightweight fight, I'll tell you that. But Dustin Poirier is coming back in. The last dance for Dustin Poirier to get gold around his waist. I ain't too optimistic myself about it, but, you know, we can be shocked sometimes. Uh, do you think that the shock is on the car for a fight like this? Uh, what do you think of the fight? Does it get you going? Should they have held off maybe to that arm and so you can fight maybe a little bit later on in the year? Curious to hear your thoughts on this one, Harry. 
So look, from a storyline perspective, you the story writes itself, right? Poirier is and has been one of the most loyal servants to the UFC in a long, long, long time. He is one of the nice guys. He is one of the good guys, the good fight foundation, the this, the that, the next thing. Everything he puts out in the sport, the way he portrays himself as the family man and the father and this and that, the next thing, the, the training partner, et cetera, et cetera. It is obvious that he is a, a person that for the most part we we look up to, right? He is obviously a future UFC Hall of Famer. And so there's all of these sorts of nuances and 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 positions and obviously he's gone out and in his last couple he looked great right like the bsd fight was was just a wonderful wonderful performance from him and that was a fight that i was questioning whether he still had it in the tank clearly still has it in the tank against that level of competition but Benoit saint denis and islam makachev are just not the same human at all they're not the same prospect they're not the same level of of excellence and you are correct. MMA sometimes shocks us. I would be shocked for sure if Dustin Poirier goes out and gets it done over uh, Islam Bakachev. Do I think it can happen? Sure. It's MMA. These things do happen. Do I think it will happen? No. I mean, you know, Dustin is joking at the moment on social media about jumping the guillotine and whatever. At this point, it's not even... It's not. It doesn't even feel like it's a conscious decision. It just feels like that is something that he has practiced over his 20 years in mixed martial arts. And it's just the thing that his body does when a takedown comes in that he knows that he can't defend. And whilst I think he offers Islam some interesting questions on the feet, I just don't see how it stays on the feet for significant periods of time. I just think Islam is too much of a complete fighter. I just think Islam is too smart as a fighter. And I I worry for Dustin Poirier that we see him taken down, beaten on the ground pretty quickly and, and submitted within a couple of rounds, if not the first round. What you're hoping that this will bring out with Dustin Poirier is, you know, and I think he will realize this is his last chance. Will oh, it? Will, has to be. Yeah. Will it be? Will he find, like? will he find it in him to kind of recreate that level of fire that he needs to get his performance levels up to the levels that he needs to get them at to face on Islam? I think, yeah, it will, but you know, how much is the wear and tear and the recent wars and the battles that he has been in over recent years going to play a factor in it? Um, How much does that mental hurdle come into it where he does get taken down and put on his back because I think you're going to be foolish to think that um, he's not going to be in this fight but are we foolish to think that Islam Mahachev is going to simply want to uh, you know turn into this into a grappling fight Harry I mean we saw him go out there and bang with Alexander Volkanovsky I think the real nail in the coffin maybe for Dustin Poirier's championship uh, aspirations would be if Islam Mahachev were to go out there and stand and bang with somebody like Dustin Poirier, maybe put my way on the feet. Because I think he does have the capabilities of doing that also as well in this fight. And um, yeah. Yeah. you think, are, are you did, like, I mean, I know that you're going to agree with what I said, so maybe let's go down a different avenue here. Do you think these kind of fights are doing Islam Mahachev justice in proving that he's as great a fighter as he should be called? Because, you know, he's not fighting all that regularly. He's um, He's coming in against Dustin Poirier. Now, look, if he wanted they wanted the Sir you can fight, you would have beaten Sir you can already as well. But you know, he has a good win over Charles Oliver to win the title. He has two win good wins over uh, Alexander Volkanovsky. Um, Dustin Poirier, guy, you know that you can't argue too much against. You, you're giving him the nice guy card, right? Should Dustin Poirier? Let's be real. Should he really be fighting for the lightweight title, coming off the back of one win over Benoit Saint Denis? Probably not. Let's be real here, but we give him the nice guy card because we're not as uh, <laughs> we're not as stringent on nice guys as we are against guys we don't like, and that's maybe just human nature that exists within all of us. But it has to be said, um, a win over Dustin Poirier leads Islam 
down a path where he needs to be looking at facing some of the really young and up and coming talent in the lightweight division. Your Armin Soryukin should be next. Your Raphael Fazeev possibly coming up in the rankings if he can pick up another couple of wins as well. Um, I think Justin Gaethje may have probably fought his way out of title contention with that Max Holloway defeat. And, and that brings me to Max Holloway. Is Max Holloway now a major player in the lightweight division? And is there a possibility you see Islam fighting him down the line as well? What do you think Islam has to be, has to do with the, his career? And I think the next, the next three to four years for Islam are going to define whether we're calling him an, a really great fighter or an all time great fighter hall of fame level i think you probably will be hall of fame but i mean to be considered one of the greatest of all times you've got to be putting yourself in there against young hungry animals against you know in fairness he went in and he fought falconowski but he fought falconowski with a clear kind of weight advantage let's be real uh, come fight night and once at short notice as well not taking away too much from those wins but i mean it's the same kind of criticism as we, we heard about Habib. It was like Habib was just starting to get going in his career and he stopped altogether. You think that there's a fear that this may happen with Islam Mahachev? Maybe. I think, look, the first Alex fight, we have to... We have to... Okay, the context of the weight is, is one thing, right? The context of the weight is definitely a thing. But we also must remember that Volkanovski was pound for pound number one in the number world one, for sure i'm, de I'm not de definitely not taken away from that first fight for sure and i think what happened after that fight is it just sent 155 into chaos because they immediately knew well islam's not going to fight during ramadan and they're going to do another fight and they've got to do another fight because it was close to the first one and blah 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 blah, blah. and so then you've got people like Charles and Dustin and Justin and Armin and Raphael Fazeev and Gamrot all fighting each other and meaning that win streaks, win streaks are getting snapped. Fighters are picking up losses. Fighters are picking up bad decisions here, there and everywhere. And you then inject the Max Holloway who, don't get me wrong, looked amazing against Justin Gaethje. But Justin Gaethje was riding a two-fight win streak coming into that fight. If he beats Max Holloway, he's right there under thereabouts for a title shot. Dustin Poirier gets whacked uh, start of 2023, comes in 2024, gets his win over BSD, comes out. Now he's a title. Now he's got a title shot. Charles de Bronx again. He should have potentially been right back in there, but had to fight Armand Saryukin. It's just it feels as though you you talk Benny Daggers. Coming off a two loss streak, coming uh, Rafael Fazeev, two loss streak. Moni Moicano, okay, he's coming off a three fight win streak, but he's never nowhere near a title shot right now. Do you know what I mean? Michael Chandler, again, lost his last fight. It's just 155 is such a lion's den that it is so hard, I think, to build the division to get people there or thereabouts, ready for Islam Makachev, especially when he's missing almost two months of the year fighting anyway, or training anyway. And so I think some of this is Islam Makachev, where he could have said, I don't want Dustin Poirier. Whoever wins out of Charles and, and, and Armin, I want them. Or if it's Armin, I want Armin. If Charles wins, I want Dustin. What, like whatever, right? Whatever it is. Part of it is is Islam. Part of it is just 155 is a bit of a mess and timing is so, so hard. It hasn't really... Like, at the start of this year, things were starting to kind of take shape, but it's kind of like being all over the place again, really, hasn't right. it? And you you mentioned Max Holloway. What what do we do with Max Holloway? Like, I do don't know. I don't do think... I don't like to see him in there with Islam. I don't want to see that, to be honest. I don't want to see that either. But let, let's just go through. So I'm just... I'm on topology. Sorry, Sean. Top five guys, right? Number one, obviously, Islam. Second is Charles de Bronx coming off a loss. You can't do Max versus Charles coming off a loss. I mean, you can. You absolutely can. But you probably shouldn't from a from a, 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 a meritocratic yeah. perspective. Yeah. Armin Saryukin should not have to do any more in order to get a title shot. But no, I think he's not. Yeah, he should be uh, definitely right. number one. I never thought I'd probably say this, but like, you know, you use the gimmick title, the BMF title, and you use it to make Max Holloway's fights a little bit more interesting. Like I said, after that last fight, 
have him defend the BMF title against Charles Oliveira. Maybe the fucking winner of that fight takes on the winner of McGregor versus Chandler then. You know, there's a couple of big fights there that you can have. For sure. You know, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, when you're Max Holloway and you put yourself in a position against just Justin Gaethje and you perform the way you performed and you finish the fight the way you finish the fight, I can't be too critical about what that man wants because what that man wants and is what that man deserves. And it's all about what Max Holloway. But I think there's there's a lot more financially secure avenues to go down to Max Holloway than maybe going for Max Holloway than to go maybe and fight. Look at the the Ilya Taporia fight has to be mentioned too. You could go back down and fight Ilya Taporia. Are you if you lose that, and which you probably are going to, to be honest, you know, does that take a little bit of the shine off the BMF title? So do it you does. risk that? Yeah, I think you you know you just kind of keep that, you keep what you have. You don't have to worry about cutting weight and you have a couple of fun fights. I mean just Max one. Holloway versus Charles Oliveira. That's a very winnable fight for Max Holloway. And Conor McGregor, Conor McGregor is a damn winnable fight for him at this stage too, to be honest. Let's line this up, right? BMF title. Money Moicano is on a three-fight win streak and called for a fight for the BMF title. I don't think Money Moicano is, is the right fight for Max Holloway. But if you want to allow Max Holloway another fight at 155 that he just dusts off and it's easy, that's an easy one. I think Rafael Fazeev versus Max Holloway for the BMF title is a fantastic fight. I understand two losses, but a fantastic fight. I love the Charles Oliveira fight for, for Max Holloway. I actually think if you're Max Holloway, you're, you've got so much buzz and so much hype right now Conor McGregor has just been announced. If Conor goes out, win or lose against Michael Chandler, that Conor McGregor fight is right there for you. And you'll be yeah. like, oh, so you can't win a real fight, right? You can't win a, you can't win this. You can't win at 170. Come back down to 155. Fight me for the BMF. And I, I can't look going full circle here. We start talking about Conor again. If Conor does go out and beat Chandler, that makes the, uh, a potential fight with Max Holloway for the BMF title absolutely blockbuster as well. Blockbuster. I think if Connor goes out and beats Chandler at 170, they book Leon Edwards the next day. Probably. The yeah. There's no probably. Yeah. Because yeah, Connor wants. Think about it. If Connor sits on top of that cage and says, I'm the first fighter to win a title in three weight classes, unless Alex Bahia gets there before him. But like, I, if, if, if he can win a title, in three different weight classes, that is an unbelievable achievement. Obviously, an unbelievable achievement. It feels as though that's been what he's angling for for a little while. He has talked and talked and talked in his career before about going up through the weight classes and, and fighting there. He wanted to fight Kamara Usman all the way back when. Uh, and so, you know, there there's certainly been talk behind Turn, it. Turn Woodley was the first one, I guess, at Welterweight uh, 2, staring each other down at the 205 weigh-ins. Yeah, yeah. Um, RDA at 170 was, was RDA was at 155 before the broken foot, right? That's right, yeah. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, so like, yeah. there's been th these fuckers need to stop fucking flitting weight classes. I can't, I can't keep. Straight. It's hard to keep up, ain't it? Hard like, to keep up. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I feel like there is a, there are so many avenues for somebody like Max Holloway. And actually, one of the things that is very interesting and that I've seen on social media is beforehand the BMF was a real gimmick. People hated it when they when it first came around. They just liked the fight that, that that crowned it. Now it feels like because of the reverie around Max Holloway, because who people see him as, people actually like the title. They they feel like it means something. What they feel like it means is they've tied it to these fighters that go to war and these fighters that end fights in these crazy dramatic finishes. People already have forgotten that what Max Holloway did for 24 minutes and 58 seconds was put on an absolute striking clinic and not really get hit too much. And then because he finishes the fight the way he finishes it, everyone's like, that's exactly what the BMF title is. Max Holloway's a G, he's this, he's that, he's the next thing. Chuck him in there against X fighter. And so I think he has brought a level of legitimacy to that title that he could then use to leverage. Blessed motherfucker now it's known as not the not, not the BMF. Oh man, like I had God, I had two I had two people text me the night when that fight was going on asking me what BMF stood for. And I absolutely was so cringe. <laughs> I was cringing when I was telling them what it was. I was like, oh God. It was terrible. So but yeah, I look at guilty. I mean 
not a big fan of the gimmick title, but I was, I'm here saying Max should defend it next, so we're legitimizing it by saying that, but whatever. It is what it is. Uh, you know, it's not going to change. We can stay here and, and, and give out about it until the cows come home, but, you know, the UFC brass have found some value in it. And, I mean, you go out and you, you know, it's the most talked about fight on, on the biggest card of the year. We ain't get, we're not going to get rid of that anytime soon. We were going to talk about other fights, Harry. We went on a little bit longer than what we should. I'll let you round it off with two quick ones. Let's talk about the co-main event at 3.02 and the co-main event at, I believe, which will be 3.03. And that is, um, well, maybe not the co-main event at 3.03, but two fights that were announced. First fight, Sean Strickland versus Paolo Costa. Second fight, Jamal Hill. Quick turnaround against Khalil Roundtree Jr. Love to hear your very quick thoughts on both of those fights. Strickland Costa. I think Strickland wins that fight. Um, I think that Costa hits hard, but we've seen Costa when you chuck some volume at him can can be can, can struggle to deal with it. Uh, but he does hit hard. I think it's a great fight. It'll be competitive. Uh, but I just think that the Drickus Duplessis versus previous amount of uh, shit talk ahead of that fight I tell you. Oh, unbelievable amounts yeah just, just yeah. ridiculous amounts um and then uh the other fight you mentioned was John Hill Hunter. Hill versus Khalil Roundtree Jr very happy for Khalil Roundtree Jr to get an uh, an opportunity like this but you know was it Dr Nick there doing the medical checks after UFC 300 I wonder to allow Jamal Hill back so quickly I mean I don't know about that one Harry what do you I don't like that fight at all for, for Jamal Hill. Like I understand he immediately wants his get back. I, I completely understand that. I, I, I know that, that fighters don't like sitting on losses. And so I completely understand why Jamal Hill would want to get back in. But Khalil Rancher Jr. is no fucking slouch. And, he, and Jamal Hill must have no regard for his poor Achilles tendon either. You're going in against Alex Behe in your first fight back after tearing your Achilles right off the bone. And then you're like going to take a fight another two months later against Khalil Roundtree Jr. is also known for like Khalil Roundtree Jr. Go and ask what uh, what he does to legs to Modestus Bukaukas. I mean, yeah, talk to me. Talk to me after you have a word there with poor Modestus because he absolutely destroyed Modestus's knee with that uh, that oblique kick. And I mean, whew, I, I, the minute I saw that, that was the first thing I thought about was like, Khalil kicks like a truck. And I'm like, wow. And I know he didn't really take too much damage with his... Uh, with his Achilles, but you, you know, if you watch the replay of that Alex Bahia knockout, you can see his Achilles going in that again. He lo it loses balance. It kind of falls under him, similar enough to what we've seen with uh, Mirko Krokop and, and Gabriel Gonzaga, that the time he he uh, struck him with that head kick, which I, is 15 years old. I saw a tweet earlier on this 15. today. 15, I remember that. I'll never forget that moment in Manchester, Gonzaga and Krokop, man. It was insane. I was still in secondary school. Fuck, man, that's crazy. I was, I was fifteen. Yeah, it's, it's like to what to see Kunza or to see Krokop go down like that with his like basically his trademark shot was oh man, I, those are like little small moments in time that sometimes you might forget when you see it. It's just things that you'll think about again. But uh, look at that rounds us up for the severe setup. We went in many different avenues. Um, we will be back next week with the balance breakdown. It's been a while since we had a balance, balance breakdown, but uh, thus, um, you know, that's what we're going to uh, go back to the general flow of the week next week. One balance breakdown, one severe setup. As always, I will be joined by Harry Powell, and I always have a great time chatting about fights with him, and I'll have just as much fun breaking down some fights as well next week off that ufc card we'll see what else is going on as well until then i hope you enjoy the fights it's a busy busy time for mixed martial arts right now it's it's a busy busy time ireland went five and oh this weekend or last weekend i should say on the on the international mma scale Jer burns will flory um dennis frimpong dennis frimpong uh andreas binder and Tiernan Loughran all picked up wins last weekend for Irish Mixed Martial Arts on the up and up. It's a great time to have uh, an Irish Mixed Martial Arts podcast too, Harry. The old triangle tune in um, as I well. <laughs> and that's uh, enough plugging from me. Take care, everybody. Thanks for listening. At BJJ underscore Harry Powell. At Ioneal MMA. That's been the severe setup. <laughs>